Henry Martin was an infantryman in the 106th Infantry Division, which was manning a forward position on the morning of the 16th of December 1944. After days without even seeing the enemy, a massive artillery barrage suddenly forced him to take cover in his foxhole. About half an hour later, Martin spotted hundreds of German Volksgrenadier infantry charging towards his position. He later recalled the scene. They acted like they were drunk. They came over the hill screaming and shrieking. Their shrill screams went right through my head. I was absolutely terrified. This attack marked the beginning of the Schnee Eiffel encirclement. The largest mass surrender of American troops ever in the European continent, and the worst disaster to befall the United States during the Battle of the Bulge. More than six months earlier on June the 6th, the Western Allies launched a cross-channel invasion of France, landing in the region of Normandy. Following an attritional battle on the beachheads, the Allies broke out into the French countryside and drove the German armies all the way back to the Reich's border. A combination of fierce enemy resistance, poor terrain and lack of supply forced the Allies to pause offensive operations for the rest of the year. By December of 1944, both the Allies and the Soviet Union were prepared to invade Germany itself. In Berlin, the Führer had grown increasingly isolated and desperate to turn the tide. He decided to launch an all-or-nothing counter-offensive in the West, with the objective of destroying the American and British armies. The plan, codenamed Watch on the Rhine, was intended to smash through the American forces defending the heavily forested Ardennes region, before encircling the Commonwealth armies in the Netherlands. Then, he hoped to negotiate a separate peace with the Western Allies, in order to turn his attention to defeating the Soviets. The plan was extremely risky and required poor weather to keep the overwhelming air power of the Allies grounded. Furthermore, the Panzer spearheads would need to navigate the dense woods and poor roads of the Ardennes at rapid pace. Germany's top generals doubted such an operation could succeed, even if they agreed that it was worth attempting. One of the key objectives of the counteroffensive would be the capture of the key road junctions of saint Vite and Bastogne. The 5th Panzer Army was tasked with seizing these two towns, which lay in the central part of the attack. First, American units in the Schnee Eiffel Forest must be destroyed to allow for columns of German tanks and mechanised infantry to advance. The Schnee Eiffel is the only part of the Ardennes which extends into Germany, representing a valuable propaganda tool for the Allies. The forest was occupied by the American 106th Division, which was entirely inexperienced having arrived on the front just five days prior to the attack. Facing them were two German Volksgrenadier divisions, made up mostly of new recruits and older men. They were to be used in frontal assaults in order to open up the way for the panzer formations. In the days following their deployment to the front, the men of the 106th Division had the rattle of German tanks and other vehicles as they formed up in assembly areas, but their inexperience made them oblivious to the danger. Private First Class Fred Smallwood remembered, There were sounds drifting across the valley, of wheels turning and grinding, and motors running. But what did we know? We were new to combat, and anything we heard sounded ominous. We told the officers what we had heard. They said it was probably the Germans playing the noises over a PA system to harass us. Although the 422nd and 423rd Infantry Regiments occupied an exposed salient which could be threatened with an encirclement, the 106th Division's commander, General Alan W. Jones, was forbidden from pulling his men back. Rather, Allied High Command saw the area as a potential springboard for a future offensive into Germany. At 6am on December the 16th, the ground offensive began. One of the first attacks was repulsed by American cavalrymen defending the left flank of the 106th Division. As the German forces were retreating, one shouted to the Americans in English, Take a 10 minute break, we'll be back, to which a US lieutenant responded, we'll be waiting for you. However, the sudden assault caught most other US Army units off guard, and the Volksgrenadiers made steady advances throughout the day. The German forces took heavy losses, despite the advantage of surprise. A veteran German company commander, Lieutenant Kurt Schwertweger, later wrote that he couldn't help but pity the soldiers under his command, most of whom were barely 18 years old. Some openly cried with fear before this, their first and last battle. 
The Volksgrenadiers advanced and were immediately hit with artillery and machine gun fire, as Schwertweger's men took massive casualties. One of my boys had brought along his Hitler youth trumpet, which he played to urge his comrades into battle until American fire cut him down. Nonetheless, the attack made progress, threatening to cut off the almost 9,000 men of the 422nd and 423rd regiments. Although there was still a chance to rescue the situation, two miscommunications doomed the men of the 106th Division. At his headquarters in San Viet, General Jones did not have a clear view of what was happening, and decided to send his only reserves to secure an escape route for his forward regiments as night fell. Instead, his men found themselves lost in the dark and took the wrong road. Furthermore, a shoddy phone connection between Jones and his own commander left Jones believing that he should leave his exposed regiments in place rather than withdraw them. By the morning of the 17th of December, the Germans had encircled the Schnee Fell, two-thirds of the 106th Division, the unit with the youngest average age in the US Army was now cut off. The 422nd and 423rd Infantry Regiments in the heart of the Schnee Fell still had no idea the disaster which had befallen them. In fact, most of their units didn't fire a single shot during the first day of the offensive as the main battles were raging on their flanks. Like their German counterparts, many of these men were not fit for combat. The future writer Kurt Vonnegut was an infantryman in the 423rd Regiment, who later described his comrades as poor physical specimens who should never have been in the army. They were now faced with the terrifying prospect of either having to fight their way out of an encirclement or starving. In San Viet, General Jones held out hope that the 7th Armoured Division would launch a counterattack to re-establish communications with the trapped men. However, Brigadier General Bruce Clark arrived at Jones' headquarters just before noon on the 17th of December and told the commander of the 106th Division that his men were on their own. Chaos on the road system had paralysed the movement of American units and no counterattack could be launched. Jones, whose son was among those trapped in the pocket, became despondent and succumbed to the events swelling around him. The situation rapidly deteriorated within the pocket. German artillery constantly bombarded the forest, causing many of the young GIs to fall apart under the mental strain. Corporal Hal Taylor recalled a fellow soldier reacting to artillery for the first time. The GI collapsed on the floor of a concrete bunker and crouched with his hands over his head, even though he was completely safe. Some intentionally shot themselves in the hand or foot, hoping to be evacuated from the area without knowing they were cut off. Many of the men spent the next two days without food, as not even emergency rations had been issued before the battle began. Furthermore, German jamming and poor radios made communications outside of the pocket nearly impossible. The enemy brought up loudspeakers to play music by American bands, inducing homesickness among the trapped men. As German armour continued to move into the area en masse, the only hope of escape was to break out. The last message from divisional headquarters arrived at 8pm on the 18th of December, ordering the regiments to break out towards the town of Schoenberg. Artilleryman Pete House recalled the preparations. It was with great pleasure that I destroyed two communications radios with a pick, as they had rarely worked. The attack started at 10am the next morning, but the German forces used their time to fortify the ring around the Schnee Fell. Faced with massed machine gun and artillery fire, the attack was a disaster as the GIs were repulsed with heavy casualties. The commander of the 422nd Infantry, Colonel George Descheneaux, called a council of war with his subordinates after the failed breakout. We're being slaughtered. I don't believe in fighting for glory if it won't accomplish anything. It looks like we'll have to pack it in. Colonel Charles Cavender of the 423rd came to the same conclusion. He informed his staff that, There's no ammunition left. I was a GI in World War I, and I try to see things from their standpoint. No man in this outfit has eaten all day, and we haven't had water since early morning. At 4pm, an American officer waving a white snowcap was sent forward to negotiate with the German forces. Soon after, men emerged from the forest with their hands up as they marched into captivity. The German forces were astounded by how many men they had captured, even considering the lofty hopes attached to the offensive. An officer described the scene in his diary. 
Endless columns of prisoners pass, at first about a hundred, later another thousand. Some pockets of GIs refused to surrender and fought on, but all organised resistance in the Schnee Eiffel had ended by the 21st of December. The surrender of the 422nd and 423rd was the largest mass surrender of American forces in Europe, and the second largest ever, only behind the fall of the Bataan Peninsula during the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in 1942. The exact number is disputed, but an estimated 8,000 to 9,000 men were lost to the enemy. American High Command was shocked and dismayed, as one 8th Corps officer bitterly remarked that the regiments were like two wildcats in a bush which might have done some clawing of the enemy instead of surrendering as they eventually did. General Jones was blamed for the disaster and relieved of command. He later said that, I lost a division faster than anyone else in the US Army. Despite the loss of so many men, the Schnee-Efeld debacle did cost the German forces valuable time and resources. The offensive called for 5th Panzer Army tanks to capture Sandviet by the second day of the attack. The town was taken a week later after an intense battle. The days spent encircling and destroying the Eiffel pocket severely delayed the enemy advance. Kurt Vonnegut and the rest of his comrades became prisoners of war and were forcibly moved to POW camps around Germany. Vonnegut, along with many prisoners, were transported to the city of Dresden, where they were detained in a slaughterhouse for the rest of the war. There, the future writer witnessed the firebombing of the ancient Saxon city which inspired one of his most famous novels, Slaughterhouse-Five. 